My name is Maria Voronsova. Um, I'm a taxonomist at Kew Gardens, and I will briefly take you through my journey with plant extinction. Um, I first came across plant extinction during my postdoctoral work on the spiny selenums of Madagascar. Um, and I found myself in this coastal Tanzanian area called the Ruvu Forest, searching for the plant you see here in the picture, a spiny selenum. I came to name a selenum ruvu. Um, and we rapidly discovered, and local people helped us understand, that Ruva Forest had in fact become this agricultural landscape with rice paddies that you see here, banana trees, and occasional little wild thickets not capable of supporting large trees. And to cut a long story short, we, we never found this plant. and. Um, Many years later, I was in the middle of Madagascar here, uh, searching for the unique endemic Sartidia perrieri that you see in the picture. And we searched everywhere um, for a number of years, and Sartidia perrieri was nowhere to be seen. Um, I felt that we needed to communicate the fact that these plants were missing to the global audience. And so I published preliminary conservation assessments for both of these species um, during the routine course of my work. And I came to understand that, in fact, my situation was really very common. So many unique tropical plants, especially tropical, are known from just one collection, one type specimen. And often these locations are not revisited and these plants are not found for many years afterwards. But I realized that the majority of my colleagues make a different choice from me. And when plants are missing, nobody publishes about it. Because proving extinction is actually impossible. How do you prove that a plant is absent from a really big, complicated landscape and that it's absent from the seed bank and it doesn't come back every 10 years? Proving things is difficult. Um, so there are other extinct plants I'm sure you've come across that do have a big glamorous profile that people know about. For example, this uh, rather expensive Encephalatus woodii that I, I definitely couldn't afford to have in my garden. Um, my journey with extinction also starts with my cute colleague called uh, Raphael Govertz. Uh, this is Raphael and his back garden uh, in indulging in his hobby of understanding extinct plants and growing extinct plants and looking for them. Uh, before coming to Kew, Raphael was looking for a list of plants that had gone extinct. And back in the 1980s, he realized that actually nobody had ever made a global list of extinct plants. Uh, so after he came to Kew, he scanned all botanical literature we have available in our library, gray literature, reports, florists, checklists, to make a big database of everything published on extinct plants. And the results of this analysis is what formed the backbone of the paper we published last year. So Raphael's global literature compilation identified an awful lot of names that we had to reconcile taxonomically on a global level. Um, and we concluded that 1,319 species of seed plants had been published as extinct. So nearly 600 extinct or extinct in the wild, still alive in, in botanical gardens and collections, and a further 431 rediscovered. The first question we asked during our research was why do some plants go extinct and others not? And we expected to see an evolutionary pattern where maybe some lineages are weaker than others. Um, but our formal analysis of the seed plant phylogeny um, seemed to show that extinction so far, our records of extinction, are phylogenetically random. But instead, instead of having an evolutionary driver, there seems to be some kind of driver linked to geography. Um, so throughout this talk, I'll be showing different 
different ways of mapping the same data set, the same big data set that we've been working on. This is the first one of those maps. And this shows simply the number. How many seed plants are extinct fully or extinct in the wild, not rediscovered, in which countries? Um, this mapping scheme that you see is countries um, or first level provinces for big level countries. Um, and it's a Tadwick scheme um, originally put together by Dick Bramett at Q. Um, unfortunately, a bit incompatible with animal data, but that's the scheme that many Q data sets are based on. Um, so the first thing about this map that, that's pretty important is, is all the white spaces. And um, every white space on this map is a country where no extinction has been recorded, nothing is extinct. Uh, then we ran a second analysis looking at what factors are particularly associated with extinction. And this cyania, uh, very beautiful from Hawaii, represents the biggest risks that we've identified. So unsurprisingly, the most extinctions have been recorded from islands, um, from the wet tropics, and woody perennials appear to be the most at risk. So here is the second part of our data set, and that's only plants that have been declared extinct, and then they have been rediscovered. Um, and some, some of my colleagues seem to think that the fact that rediscovery happens somehow means that extinction science is bad quality, um, or it somehow discredits the original declaration of extinction. Um, and I'd like to challenge that viewpoint here. Um, my suggestion is, is that when we suspect something may have gone missing, we need to raise the alarm as soon as possible. And it's quite natural that the process of knowledge building should lead to things being missing and then things being found again, and then maybe them being missing again. There's nothing wrong with that. You'll see the rediscovery pattern, it's a little bit different. There's still an awful lot of white spaces though, all of those white spaces where nothing has been extinct and then rediscovered. Uh, this is one example of a plant you may be familiar with that has been rediscovered, Tecophilae cyanocrocus. Um, I unexpectedly found myself on the TV rather a lot last year. Um, to present the results of our extinction paper. And after many years working in this area, this, the media exposure really made me realize that the word extinction can help draw the public's attention to plants, to botany, to ecology, to all this deep and complicated work that we do to study our ecosystems. And ordinarily plant blindness stops people really from paying much attention but since extinction has such a high profile that could be one way for us to connect our knowledge bases with the audience that we want to reach. I now reach the second part of my talk which is the work we did this year to understand the inequality of botanical knowledge and dig into why exactly is the extinction pattern so uneven across the world. So now you see the third map of exactly the same data set of what has gone extinct. Um, the islands in red have the greatest proportion of their total seed plant diversity extinct. And um, again, all of those pale green areas where nothing has been declared extinct, um, I want to show you this fantastic analysis by Carson Mayer, published in 2015, which shows that for vertebrates, at least, the richer the country is, the better their coverage of vertebrate species records. Let's look at Africa, which is in pink and purple. It has the lowest wealth overall in the world. And we can see that it has clearly the lowest vertebrate species inventory completeness. So does wealth and GDP have anything to do with it? Um, this is my fourth and final global map of the same data set. And this time, pink areas are where extinctions have been declared, and, but things haven't been rediscovered. Green is where extinctions have been declared and everything has been rediscovered again. 
dark gray are places with multiple extinctions and multiple rediscoveries. So I'd like to suggest that the dark places have had the most botanical work and the most effort since they have species at all stages of the process and they have accumulated significant data sets. So we can see significant data sets on plant extinction there in Australia, there in India, there in parts of China, there in South Africa, southern United States, Mexico. The greatest amount of work in recording extinction and rediscovery, all of it has happened in countries that are not necessarily particularly wealthy, but countries that made a good investment in recording and tracking their biodiversity, countries with a healthy botanical capacity, countries that track their biodiversity across time. And to understand the differences more closely, I started looking at a case example from my own work. I've been studying the grasses of Madagascar for a number of years now, and we just published the book you see here. And we did an analysis to compare all the relevant statistics and discovery of Madagascar grass species versus British grass species. Madagascar is twice as big as the UK and has got about twice as many grasses. Our grasses are a fantastically useful model system because grass diversity is even across the world and it works in similar ways in the, in the tropics and in temperate regions. The most common British grass has been recorded almost 300,000 times, okay? The most common Malagasy grass has been recorded <laughs> 300 times. So um, I was a bit shocked when I saw the statistic, even, even though I've worked in, in both areas. Um, so this is a, a three orders of magnitude difference of British grasses at least the most common one has been recorded a thousand times more often. Ouch. Uh, and this is my working process when I study the grasses of Madagascar. Um, so I live in Britain and I work in Kew, which is marked in red, and I use the big tropical African reference herbarium in Kew. Um, and then I have to go to Madagascar, of course, to collect plants, uh, to work with local botanists, to work in the local herbarium, um, which is unfortunately sufficient. Um, for the best herbarium collection of Malagasy plants, I have to go to Paris, which is an orange in France. Um, but then I have to also go via South Africa to look at their herbarium to understand and reconcile the species naming system with the South African grass species naming system. Um, and I'd like to propose in the time I have left that foreign driven science has fundamental consequences for how we understand biodiversity. No specimens were kept in Madagascar until 1948 there. Here, this is a picture of the uh, Jardin de Plant in Paris. Remote taxonomy is inherently lower quality. Um, this grass that you see on this slide was classified as four different species that look superficially different to anybody that hasn't seen them in the field. Um, and this is all really important for our levels of understanding. Our worst understanding possibly actually and no proper work has been done um, outside the seed plants. So our paper didn't cover anything outside the seed plants. Um, but some data is available on plantsoftheworldonline.org. Um, there are 29 species records we haven't looked into. Examples of them are here. In case anybody wants to pursue that, I'm sure Raphael's very open to collaboration. And to finish off, I think I would like to conclude that clearly many more plants are extinct than we realize, looking at this pattern, many, many more. And the key driver for why um, our knowledge of extinction is so imperfect is that many parts of the world don't have the capacity and don't have the ability to do their own botany and plant recording. Um, and foreigners coming in to do plant recording and botany, for example, in Madagascar, will never produce a quality of science and the quality of extinction records that we really need, the global knowledge is desperately uneven, 
and we need to understand the drivers of this knowledge inequality and work with poorer countries if we have any hope of understanding extinction. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Goodbye.